Hello there, and welcome to a film a day with me, Jordan Woodley. And today I get to close the curtains on the Baz Luhrmann Red Curtain trilogy with the astounding showstopper musical that is Moulin Rouge. I will confess, after all these months of doing these videos and of course going through my um, musical education, as you can tell by the... Uh, the playlist that is um, on the channel, please do check that out. Um, I will confess that prior to that, the musical that I have loved for years and I hail above all others in terms of cinematic musical is Moulin Rouge because I love this film. This film is, this it, it's possibly a guilty pleasure or an indulgence, but this just has so much going for it that I I love in terms of how Baz Luhrmann can combine his style with a certain matching up with something that he was trying to achieve by revolutionising the cinematic musical. I mean, we were in that phase. I mean, I know there had been musicals in the 90s, but the case has been made in terms of film history that the movie musical was really not at its peak anymore as it had been the 80s I want to say and it was really feeling that decline with the exception of me of the Disney animated um, musicals and so when Baz Luhrmann decided to do this this was supposed to be a restoration I suppose of the cinematic musical and it really does feel feel like that. It feels like Baz Luhrmann is not just making a musical. He is making a musical about making musicals and about the construction of musicals, the archetypes, the nature of plots, the nature of storytelling within a musical and what's relevant and what's not. And it really does feel like he's pouring himself into making something that's supposed to be this grand... Um, a love letter to the cinematic musical and the theatrical musical. Um, of course, whether that is pulled off is is to debate. And of course, there were other films that were trying to do the same thing. I mean, Chicago was only a few years behind uh, after this, um, and the case would be made that Chicago also re revolutionised the movie musical. Um, and of course, then we have Les Mis, and and people would sort of bring the case that Les Mis was really, um, yeah, Les Mis was really the, the musical, the cinematic musical that sort of want, made musicals sexy again for audiences. But you can kind of go round in circles on it. My, my point is, is that this was intended to be a musical that broke down, did for musicals what Scream did for horror, that both was a love letter told an authentic story but was also breaking down the nature of that genre and its um, and the structures it uses to tell stories and I just think to me the jukebox musical is a really tricky one there's nothing I think I suppose on one level you could have a jukebox musical like uh, Sunshine on Leaf which is really a or, or Mamma Mia which is taking a specific band and using their songs, whether it's intended or not, to structure a narrative. You could have jukebox musicals that are just a selection of popular music, you know, in, in the Glee method of just, let's choose what is popular and what has been popular over the past decade and construct a narrative around that. What I love about this is it does the reverse. It, want, it has a very specific story it wants to tell and it knows how like Baz Luhrmann demonstrate, or the writers demonstrate such a strong knowledge of musicals and not even musicals, just pop music and what, you know, sort of the last 30 years of music that they knew how to weave together songs and motifs that enhanced the storytelling rather than structuring the storytelling around the songs. You know, I won't badmouth Mamma Mia, it's an incredibly popular musical and I am in the minority of people who, I, it doesn't do it for me. And one of the biggest complaints I have is that the narrative is hamstrung by 
tr- sort of working around the songs. And and I know it's a chicken egg situation with Mamma Mia that, you know, it is conceptually supposed to work together. It just doesn't work for me because it's trying to authentically represent the, the songs. Whereas what I like about this is that it takes sections of songs and, and little bits and, and like... I think the elephant love melody is just so good because it, it it's a conversation, a, a duet between two people using certain pieces of music and, and lines of songs to have this debate about the nature of love. And I think that's so well done, you know, or um, uh, the, the this song section, which I I love this song. I think this song is a really beautiful song in its own right. But the way that it's enhanced and, and and built upon to have this, it's not just a character singing a popular song. It's the song's been restructured to feel like it was always meant as a musical song. That it was always meant, it was written as if it was written for a musical in that context, you know. And, and, and it does go over the top. I, I appreciate that the biggest criticism of Baz Luhrmann's style Particularly, say, when we enter the Moulin Rouge, is that it's so manic and it has so many uh, musical stylings going on and dance styles and you and, and you have tons of people there. And then you also have the sort of the mugging to camera, and the fact that, you know, you don't even get the opportunity to appreciate the scale and size of it because you have main actors essentially coming right up close to camera to almost block everything. But... What I like about that is it creates that sense of mania and chaos. And then the Moulin Rouge, particularly from the perspective of Christian, as this sort of wet behind the ears, uh, penniless artist who's turned up and, and knows what he wants but has no knowledge of the world, and he enters this space and it is just chaos and music and people, and then it's immediately shut down because Satine takes the stage and she takes control. And it does then return to the chaos, but, you know, it, it, it's intentional. It's intentional that you struggle to get a grip of what's going on. And, and there are many sequences that do that, 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 you know, the audience is supposed to barely be clinging on by their fingertips because it's so much, and, you, and it's supposed to... Over, the function is to overwhelm. Um... And I just think it has such a great cast. I mean, Jim Broadbent. Jim Broadbent, I, 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 it's funny, really, how the memory plays. I remember going in thinking, oh, Jim Broadbent, I remember, he's great as a character, but can't sing. He can't even, he can't hold a note. And he does open in the, um, in the Moulin Rouge song, the big Welcome to the Moulin Rouge song, doing the speak singy thing that really strongly implies he can't sing, that, that I remember. But then there's a later song where he demonstrates that he can. He has a very specific vocal style, so he doesn't really fit the pop stylings, which is why they don't try to force his voice into doing that. But he clearly has musical theatre um, ability. Uh, and he's just great. He's, you know, and, and, you know, of course, you have the whole troupe. And, and of course, Ewan McGregor and, and Nicole Kidman just have such wonderful chemistry. I mean, as I say, the, the, the uh, Elephant Love Melody is... Is so good and it works because they just have such a strong rapport and you genuinely believe in their the, sort of their love story and that you know their chemistry works so well in that regard and, and i suppose what i like about the whole ensemble is there are two levels to it and again this feeds into what i'm saying about the sort of meta text of it that every character is presented initially in an archetypal style you have your love sick broken-hearted artist you have your you know your over-the-top supporting um troop you have your big personality um and show owner and of course you have your uh, femme fatale um who, who's slowly seduced into the ways of you know into into real love and then, and then you have your villain but then what the film does is it presents those facades and then it allows you a deeper appreciation of each character and and it varies to different degrees how much that works. Like, I obviously, I do think it works for Satine and Christian. I don't think it works for everyone. Um, for instance, I think the one who stands out the most is, is the villain. I genuinely think they are, like I say, the archetypal moustached villain. And then they 
one to give him more depth in terms of someone who is much more threatening and much more dangerous but I don't think it carries across the sense that he is both superficial and complex at the same time which many of the other characters do have that um and yeah I I it's funny really because I suppose thinking about musicals and their sort of their their structuring in terms of the cinematic musical you know in terms of the the, the spectrum or, or the quad the, the the triangle let's say for the minute you have at one corner something like um rent where rent what it tries to do is it completely strips away the theatrical style of it and tries to go okay we have the songs and we have the story let's work out how to tell this cinematically and so the way it's shot is shot in a way that's like this is as if it was made for cinema it was never a stage musical it is you know and, and there are moments where it does it doesn't do that and it and that sort of you know where it kind of falls back into the theater style um but broadly it's supposed to be as if it's you know any performances there are are almost like music videos and it's supposed to feel like the cinema musical then you have Chicago, which is very feet deep within the musical style. You know, it is, you know, constantly paying homage to the stage. And every time someone performs, um, the, the, the way that it's shot makes it then start to look like you're viewing it on stage, you know, each song. And then what this does is it kind of marries them together or, or maybe does something slightly different where there is something stagic about it it spends most of the time on a stage and yet because it uses sort of um magical storytelling to then enhance itself it then sort of lifts above so it's not realistic it's not stagic it, it's it's fantasy it's in the fantastical realm of of so so you'd have say your real world events then you have the songs that sort of feel like they're they're sort of having that stagey style and then it's almost like they then ethereally lift above that and they become you know the moon itself starts to sing and that level of sort of surrealism to sort of make it feel magical and beyond sort of plain cinematic and the theater homage um and I think it really works with this. I don't know. I don't know if this is the sole example where it would work, and whether they sort of went, okay, Moulin Rouge is a sort of singular event, and you can't really replicate that, because I've never seen it done quite like Moulin Rouge again. But I might. I as as the musical uh, playlist demonstrates, I don't have such a strong knowledge of um, the musical genre that I would confidently say one way or another. Um. But yeah, I, I just I just think it's such a I don't know. There's something about it with them. the songs are so strong and they really resonate. The characters are good, and and it does have issues. It has issues of plotting. It has issues where because it's trying to be surrealist and silly and serious and complex and superficial, it it, it does have that same issue that that the previous Red Curtain trilogy has, which is that it struggles to be consistent in its tone. So you'll have, you know, it opens with Christian weeping as he's beginning to write the story. And then it cuts to, you know, him being in his flat, as he, you know, a year earlier. And then people fall through the thing and, and, and you know, it's bouncing around and it becomes manic. And then it calms down and then it, they're, they're in the Moulin Rouge and it goes wild. And it, it, it does struggle under the weight of trying to change its pace every five or ten minutes because... It's just it's it, that's such a burden in terms of that style to do. It also, you know, it, the other Baz Luhrmann thing that I've mentioned in the other two uh, installments is that it does struggle with the ending. Now I think of the endings, this is the best one. That as much as Romeo and Juliet should have been the the, the best one, I think there are issues there are issues that I've mentioned in it where I say, oh, well, you know, I said how there's just something about the way that it ends that's just a little bit flat. And I think the visuals of the helicopter stuff and the candles is cool. 
I just I don't know. There was something about the ending that just just felt a little weak. Um, I had, as I mentioned, I, I had issues with uh, Strictly Ballroom with its ending because it does feel like it just drops the storyline to essentially give that big um, dance style ending. But then that fits the dance style. It fits how you know a dance theatre show works, which just you know everything's resolved through a big set piece dance movement. It just didn't really work for me. And then with this one, I think what it tries to do is... is it, Because the film is entirely about escalating to climaxes, then decompressing until it escalates again to the next climax. And it does it about three or four times. And of course, each time it's trying to be bigger and bigger so that when you get to the big set piece, you know, all the characters are on stage, there's a huge auditorium of people watching it, and it's this huge climactic thing. And then, of course, it needs to end. And the problem it then has is it does resolve storylines and it does have that sense of, OK, these characters have their ending and then this ties it up. But then it does, it, it doesn't rather, deal with certain plot constraints. And, and, and I know it's nitpicky because musicals are supposed to be a little bit magical and you're supposed to forgive certain things and go, hey, the magic of musicals means we don't need a resolution to this. But there are questions about how it ends, what happens to the supporting characters, what happens to the theatre because it's owned by the villain and then he owns the deeds as a, as a, as a security. And, and, and yes, those are nitpicky, plotty things, but those are the things that occur to me as I'm watching it going, oh, that's a really beautiful ending for those characters. But I don't fully see how the, what resolves the whole story. So, so in that respect, it does do the, the Baz Luhrmann thing where it does struggle to end conclusively but like i said it ends in such a big climax with the sort of big musical style and everyone's on stage possibly more similar to strictly ballroom than to romeo and juliet that it it, it really does achieve that scale and that climax that, that just ends so well I genuinely think this is a wonderful film and, and you know, this is this is still my benchmark for, for musicals. Nothing has yet hit that, but as these weeks go, I will continue to uh, delve into musicals and perhaps something else will, uh, will, will, will knock me for six. We'll see. Anyway, thank you for joining me. If you like the video, hit the like button, uh, comment below and share the video as so it's all helping me in the algorithm. Uh, subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell because I'll, you'll get notifications of when new videos are uploaded. Check out my uh, back catalogue of, uh, of videos, including my musicals playlist to get that sense of my journey through the, through the musical genre. And follow me on Twitter at Jordan underscore Woodley, where I'm always tweeting about TV shows and films. And I share the videos once they're uploaded to YouTube. Thank you for joining me. Take care.